So you have my check checklist. You have been through the orientation phase. You fully understand the shape of the IG and what it's trying to do. Congratulations. Now it's time to do the technical part of the review. And, and sort of generically, people in life tend to think either top down or bottom up. And you can start at the top and start with the exchange or the API first and work down towards the terminology. And then other people prefer to work up towards the uh, terminology, from the terminology up. Or you can choose the Zen method where you click on things at random until you achieve Nirvana. Um, <clears throat> if you do. I, I, my worksheet is top down. I, I think you build from bottom up, but you learn from top down. I do. Um, you don't have to follow it, but that's how I'm going to pursue it right now. So, so really, for me now, I'm at the capability statement level. I'm assuming that we're talking with the RESTful API. So work through the capability statement. What resources does it describe? For each resource, what interactions are required for the server to support? If it does search, which it probably does, what search parameters are described? Does the implementation guide say anything about modifiers and chaining and combination parameters? Um, lots of implementation guides don't go to this level of detail. Does it matter that they don't? Do you specify conformance requirements or does the implementation guide specify conformance requirements? And if it does, do you agree with them? And then again, you come back to, so here's an example of a typical um, capability statement resource. This, the US course says that you support intolerance, allergy intolerance, you support the profile US core allergy intolerance, you shall support search at the type level, and you shall support read. You should support vread, version read and histories for access to historical documents. And you may choose to support writing to the content and um, history by type. Do you agree with all those things? It depends on the requirements. <coughs> um, and then there's a two search parameters that shall be supported and a combination that, or one that shall, one that may be supported, a combination. You should pay particular attention when you are reviewing to the status fields. I'll come back to that. Um, that's proven historically, um, we can now use that word, to be a source of a great deal of trouble. Is it acceptable to say that you may support that? I will come back to that shortly. Now this is the other thing you should be looking at is, this is a textual, handwritten textual summary of the implementation guide. Um, it's a little bit cleverer than the one that is automatically generated as a summary of the capability statement. Um, not all implementation guides do such a careful job of representing the capability statement. So that's another thing to consider in your review is should, should it do more? Should the author handwrite stuff? Um, then, then there's the way capability statements bind to profiles. And this, this is tricky. This is the other place where pain surfaces for you as a reviewer. So in the resource API, you specify two kinds of profiles. Thanks so much for having a clock. So I'll just quickly find this in the spec. In the capability statement, The resource has both profile and supported profile. The profile is the base system profile for all uses of the resource, and supported profiles are a list of use case supported profiles. So, so there's two different kinds of profiles. 
Um, the system profile is what applies to all resources of the type. So if an API says for the allergy intolerance resource, this is the system profile in every allergy intolerance resource that it comes from the system shall or will or does conform to that particular profile. It may also nominate or instead nominate um, a set of use case specific rules. It says that some of the resources will meet these particular profiles for some particular use cases. So back then to US Core, I don't think people understand quite what US Core is doing because US Core says that a supported profile, a supported profile is the US Core allergy intolerance profile. So US Core does not say that all allergy intolerances will be US Core allergy intolerances, only that some of them might be. I bet not many people realize that. Um, I had a little argument with the editor about that choice. Uh, I don't think the editor himself realized quite what he was saying. Can you go back over this? Sorry. <clears throat> I missed that. I'm not sure if anyone else did. How is it that that statement was made? Can you guys hear me? Uh, just, I'm asking for a repeat. So the system level profile is something that versus, I don't know what else, what's the opposite? And then what is it that it makes that a optional profile as opposed to all shall? So when you're looking at capability statement, oops, I don't need to make any bigger. Um, and you see that you're describing a RESTful interface with a set of resources that are served by the RESTful interface. For on the resource level, you can specify the profile, the base system profile that applies to this resource on this system. So you might have a base observation profile that says all the observations supported by the system will have a code and a category and a value. You can take that to the bank. Right? Every resource. That's the profile. And then there's supported profiles. So that's where you might say, hey, we do vital signs. We do blood pressure. We do temperature. But we don't do weight and height. Right? So we list the fact that we do blood pressure and temperature and saturated oxygen. And those are supported profiles. You can't rely on the fact that every observation will be a blood pressure because, of course, we also support other kinds of blood pressures, but you can take it to the bank that we support the blood pressure profile. For which resources do we support the blood pressure profile? We've never figured out how to express that question. All we're saying here is that you can say what is true about every single resource of the type of whatever the resource type is, and you can say that we also support these additional profiles which are necessarily compatible with the base system profile. Okay? So these are basically the use cases that you support for this particular kind of resource. Is that clear? Anyone want to ask me more about that? Correct. Most implementation guides have profile, not supported profile. The US Core has supported profile. Had I reviewed this, I certainly would have picked this up. I don't think many people understood this about it. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, Paul in the back. Um, well, I'm not a US citizen. I raised it. I raised it with the editor directly. Um, feel free to take it up with Eric. I think it's a mistake. Well, 
well. I'll come back to that. So, Grant, just to summarize, Grant, uh, you are profiling the resource and you are expecting every instance of a particular resource to conform to the profile. That should be mentioned in the profile element, not just the whole profile element. Yeah. So, so probably observation is a better illustration. These are the supported profiles for observation in US Core. There's necessarily more than one of them. Great. But there's also no base things you can bank about every single observation that comes out of the system. It's just not specified. So technically, you can serve up anything that's a valid observation and say it's a valid US Core API, as long as you don't make any claim about the resource itself. All right. I think it should also have a US base core observation profile that all of them have to sort of you know, conform to. to be, I'm still trying to formulate this, but there's a big gap between the system and the individual profile that seems like you could drive a truck through it. You know, if you've got, let's say, vital signs, you want all your vital signs to conform to a given profile, in some sense that's like at the system level. Um, you've, you've nearly put your finger on the things we haven't sorted out. Can I, can I not pursue it right now? Do I, does everyone want me to? Um, it's, it's, it's complicated because the intersection between base system and use cases and how you define use cases and, and what obligations come along and, and, and then there's the set of things that actually say about supported profiles in detail. Um, so what I submit, suggest that anybody's interested in doing is um, <coughs> go to the base spec um, and read, uh, I think it's on the profiling page, no, documentation profiling. Um, Yeah, yeah, we have problems there. Um, go and read this section here on the profiling page, two uses of profiles, and if you still want to ask me about it, if enough of you say on Julep in the implementers channel that you want me to talk about it, we'll do a breakout in the Connectathon, and I'll go through it in fine detail, okay? <coughs> All right. And, of course, in addition to this issue, the implementation guide can declare global profiles that says if you claim to be supporting this implementation guide, every resource has to conform to this irrespective of how you encountered it, encountered it which has its own issues. But um, uh, this is, again, it's that whole intersection between what the system's doing, what the user's wanting it to do, what the implementation guide lays out. So it's an example of the kind of things that you can get. So the capability statement checklist includes check system profile, check use case profiles, and check global profiles. And to make sure that the conformance expectations are clear. And as you can see from this discussion, complexity means that it's not easy. And there's plenty of space to be unclear. Okay. Now, um, moving on from that to profiles, the next thing is to say I'm going to review the profiles. And typically I will work through, if I'm doing systematic, I'll work through the API looking at the profiles, saying what do the profiles actually say. So when we'll go back to US Core. Um, uh, a typical observation, a typical, sorry, a profile will have some kind of summary, textual summary representation telling you about what this profile says, mandatory, must support, 
a list of examples or example uh, a differential a text summary which is a repeat statement of those things the differential view which is what this profile says and then a summary a full view or a snapshot view we use either word which is what this means in full detail given what everything else has been said so if you want to know what is being said here then you just use a differential view but if you want to actually if you're implementing it and you're looking at going the fixed subject what else is what else is there that that is still there that's what the full view is for but that's everything um, and the full view really is as Mark Kramer demonstrated this week, potentially every, very, very full. Yeah, can you show that, that one from the rest of the radiology? Um, um, uh, what's the quickest way for me to find it? Probably here. Um, well, I, I mean, would it be? Yes, it would. That's not necessarily the quickest way to find it. Would that be the most productive way for me to, uh, to spend my time? It's not me you put on the spot. I didn't design the model. Here's the problem. Let me explain to everyone what we're talking about. Those, uh, those summaries, both the differential and the snapshot, can get very, very complicated, especially where there are, when there's a lot of slices. And I, look, I came upon, upon one that I, I got a screenshot, and the, the, the screenshot looked like a, a long, like a 16-inch pencil. You know, and, and so I was, I'm very familiar with the way that snapshots and differentials look, and I can make sense of it. It's Maybe this just falls into the category of punting it back to the authors and saying, I can't make uh, sense of it, but uh, so the rendered form was a human recall. So, so there's several things going on here. This is more an editor's discussion, but okay, in terms of review, I thought this was a bad model. I think that a lot of these things are presented as component observations and they shouldn't be component observations. And I just jumped forward a few slides because this is something you should review, which is misuse of contained resources and component observations. You must look at that. And, and here you have a whole pile of component resources and it's just a long, long, long list of component resources, which I don't think most of them should be. But, but it's an open discussion. But maybe they should be. That's, that, that's a, it's a semantic argument, which you can join the observation, orders an observation, which is its ongoing discussion. Um, and, but then I look at it also and say, irrespective of whether that's a good design or not, we need to do something more about presentation and representation, so I'm thinking about that, and we have another discussion going about that. <clears throat> but it was a spectacularly good example, Mark, or bad example, depending on your perspective. Um, but, but in the end, you know, I'm used to looking at CDA or version 2 implementation guides or fire implementation guides where the implementation advice on the profile runs to hundreds of pages. Right, that's just the way they work, because there is a lot of stuff to say. <clears throat> so we may be able to do a better job. It's an ongoing discussion. But, but merely size is not actually, you know, per se, an issue. So, so you should review in the profile the text summary. There should be a human-to-human -human text summary that's meaningful. Um, that tells you, at least orientates you. What the heck are you doing? Um, so we'll go back to the one you just talked about, Mark. This, um, this text summary here is reasonably described as not helpful. It's what I knew how to generate automatically. But you can always describe at a human level manually something better than what I can describe automatically. That's my automated text summary. 
And the bigger the resource gets, the more you need to say, to say something more useful than what I can infer observationally in code. So, so look at the text summary and be, feel free to actually say, no, you need to explain this better. Um, and you can see there's not a lot of human explanation on this one. So you should, you know, it's reasonable to expect that. Um, you should check that the differential is consistent with a text summary and you should look at what other related profiles exist in other implementation guides. And then for each element in the differential, this one, you should, oops, you should work through it. Now I'm gonna show you a little trick that not every implementer or editor bothers helping you with, but see up here, which you can't see because it's tiny, but this will be blah, 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 blah dot HTML. Change it to XLSX. Oh. <laughs> Phew, so much for that. I thought that was a guaranteed thing. Um, so let's go to US Core. I will make sure of this in the future. Ah, oh, ah, oh. this is what comes, ah. Uh, um, okay, clearly I need to have a little chat with David Johnson um, because uh, every single, um, I need to go and look at my local copy um, of, but we'll look at SDC in my local copy. <coughs> The trouble is XLSX, the server is refusing to serve them up. And I checked that myself on my local copy of some implementation guide. Every, so we'll go to my local copy of SDC, um, an artifact. Uh, what happened to the artifacts? Maybe I should have rebuilt it less recently. No, I'm looking, oh, the CI build, that's what I need to be looking at, okay. Um, the CI build is, knows about XLS files, so um, not that it matters then. Um, okay, so you're looking here at a differential, and you go up to HTML and change it to SSLX, and you get a little spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet contains when it finally opens, what happened to it? Here. That's not it. Ah, oh, here. No. I thought it had come down. Ah, here we go. So this is a spreadsheet form of the differential with everything populated so that you can just work through the spreadsheet doing your review. It can, can be more um, suitable for like a review process. And, and it's always published I just forgot to check before my tutorial, the HL7 web server only serves up files for which it knows the mime type. So I'll have to go and sort that out with David Johnson. When you're looking at the implementation at the profile and you've got this text summary differentials snapshot table, just change the HTML to XLSX. But, but it's always there and we have, originally we encouraged the authors to remember to provide a link but now that we template it, we can just, the template can do that. <coughs> um, so much for that good idea. <coughs> Where am I? All right, I'll there we go. Okay, so you should go through and look at the definitions and the mappings. Must support, um, must support. There's a flag on the element, every element to say whether you must support it. Um, this is a great way for everybody to get confused. In the base specification, we never say whether an element has to be supported or not, 
because we don't know what it means to say that it has to be supported because it's very specific to the use case context. But in an implementation guide, you have a context. So in an implementation guide, you can say that a, um, that a particular element has to be supported. And then you can also define what it means to say that it must be supported. For instance, maybe it means that if you have it in the database, it has to be in the resource when you serve up the resource unless the patient didn't agree to share it, for instance. Or you might mean that if the application receives a resource with that element populated, the application must display it. It, the definition of must support is really clear, which is you can't use it unless you explain what you mean by using it. So you should check because you'll often see this. So let's go look at a US or STC. Um, here's a good example. We've got the author in the room. A uh, whole bunch of resource of elements labeled must support. You must support URL version so forth. So somewhere in the implementation guide, Lloyd, it will explain what that means. Where? <laughs> uh, I thought, was hoping Lloyd would know this straight off the top of his head. Oh, here we go. Conformance and must support. <sighs> For this implementation guide must support shall be interpreted as follows. And then what it actually means here. So if you see an implementation guide that labels something as must support, you can reasonably expect it to explain what it thinks that means. And if it doesn't, then you ballot that automatically, right? Because there's no defined, that's what must support means, unless the implementation guide says so. All right, um, check the cardinality and the constraints. So this is the other thing. So many people review a guide and get confused between minimum cardinality zero and must support. They are different, meaning different things. Cardinality zero means it doesn't have to be present. Cardinality one means it has to be present. Must support means you have to put it in if you have it and other rules are satisfied, but there are valid cases where it doesn't exist. So minimum cardinality is still zero. But a lot of people, it, data is complex, and so we have those variety of ways of saying things, and it's pretty common feedback to get as an author or to us saying, it doesn't make sense to have something as must support with a minimum cardinality zero. Actually, that's when it does make total sense. It doesn't really make sense to have something with a minimum cardinality of one and not must support. Well, that's a different story. It does make sense, but it's the corner case. Yes. Mark. Um, when you're deriving a profile from another profile, are the must supports inherited? Yes. They are inherited. I recall you asking this because you are inheriting must supports from US Core where they should not be. Well, yeah, maybe that's the answer. Is that it? is but the answer. So if that's the case, and, and I'm not convinced that that's the case because must support reflects a workflow, a, a use case. And when you use this structure, you're not inheriting the use case necessarily. So that's number one. I still thought. I think that you shouldn't assume a use case unless you're assuming a use case. It depends on what you import. If you import your IG, you are assuming whatever. So I think in, so hold on. I, you know, when someone defines a structure, like the structure of, uh, you know, with extensions and, and so forth, that in itself is pretty agnostic from the use case. That same structure could be used in many different workflows, right?
Well, so I, I, I think that's not as black and white as uh, you've just painted it, actually. So uh, I, there's... We should stop because we could... Um, we think that the problem is US score is doing double duty. That's what we think the problem is. Um, that it is serving both as a general design and a use case specific design and people have no choice but to deal with that. So let me ask you a follow up. If, if mm -hmm. that's the case, when we do IGs, domain specific IGs, and we define a structure which we believe might be useful in other use cases, should we define two profiles, one with must supports, well, one without must supports, and then one with must supports that fit a certain workflow case? In fact, there may be more than one version of that particular profile with different must supports depending on which workflow is being supported. So what I said after the last time we discussed this at the last meeting was I was going to play around with a way to make that really efficient to a user, to a to a consumer of the implementation guide, where you could like define a set of profiles and then define a set of support variants on those profiles and then have your use cases and your profiles and some kind of table that says tick, 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 tick for must support. Exactly. I didn't get to do that, but it's still something. I mean, I'll get to that later. Um, I don't know. So we, I mean, certainly there's some work we can do there, and I haven't yet done that work because we were just getting to today. Well, we've embraced yesterday. that in the in the way that we make IGs. We put the uh, we, we define the structure separately from the must support selections, and then apply the must supports at the last minute on an IG specific basis. Okay. So, so and in terms of reviewing, these are some things to think about as to where you think the IG should land. Obviously, that's a moving target. Mark, do you do those with two separate IGs, or how do you position the definition of the generalized profile? Because so, so I, think, you know, I think, um, to explain that, I'm going to take a minute or two, Graham, if you don't mind. So we view the models to be separate from the IGs, and the IGs are mixing and matching models from different model namespaces. So the structural stuff, exists independent of IGs. Now, it may be one-to-one -one with an IG, I don't know, but that we, the way that we do our modeling is we figure that those structures will be reusable. The IG is like a shopping list from those underlying models that says, I need this one and this one and that one. It's like the dependent IG thing, but we take that to a, to a further extreme, I guess, and, and then Inside that shopping list, we say this one and this attribute of this, this uh, resource is a must support. And so that we apply those must supports not at modeling time, but at, at IG preparation or configuring time. So we have a file, a separate file, which specifies what is in the IG in terms of the structure definitions. And in that file, we have a, a designator for which attributes in which um, profiles are must support for that, for that IG. We just don't have a, in my brain, structure definition to have to live inside. And, you know, are they just in purgatory? They're not resources, they're profiles. Where do they live? They don't have to live in an IG. Um, they live in a file. Uh, when you look at the guide, uh, the output of, of uh, or the, rather the input to the uh, IG publisher, there's a, there's a list of profiles, right? It's just, a, it's just a structure definition. It's a self-contained thing, right? So if you have a little macro that goes ahead and, and adds must supports to it, you can then get a derived structure definition. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, w w well, they, they do become part of the IG, and that's where, that's where the current um, naming stuff that Graham talked about right at the beginning fails us, because when we're mixing and matching, either we have to create our own profile, which if we have uh, must supports, 
it'll be in our, you know, in our um, uh, uh, URL, the, the specified URL for that. But, you know, what's the connection to the structural profile that underlies it? It's tenuous. So we'll uh, stop that with that one there. On Thank you for your hole. time. Um, yeah, maybe you can continue that one on Zulip. Um, now, the other thing that you should do is when you're reviewing a profile, is consider other related profiles and whether they sh that, that profile should inherit from the other related profile and compare it. And I'll come back to the comparing profiles later. A key question is what other related profiles exist. That is not an easy thing to answer right now. For instance, uh, I just went here to registry.fire.org and I searched for any structure definition that mentions patient, and I got 84 results, most of which are actually um, in extensions of one kind or another. So, so, and then I tried my other smarter search, it didn't work, so I've got work to do there. We know that that's a problem, and it's on my list to get better. So the other, only other way is to actually search through other apparently related registries using the registry I showed before. All right, now there's a number of special issues you should consider. Um, when you see an observation, have a good close look at observation at components and um, related items. Everybody who authors resources says to themselves, I just want a simple package. I just want everything inside the one structure. And so they use contained resources and they use component observations and they just keep sticking more stuff in the bucket. For anybody consuming information that is unfriendly because you want modularity, stability, reuse. And so there's a tension there between the two. So always when you're looking at a, um, uh, an implementation guide and reviewing it, you should ask yourself, do I see any contained resources going by. When I see an observation with components being used, are they genuinely components? I will not get into the rabbit hole of what is really a component, but the idea is that the only things you should put in components are you know, things that are not separable from the observation. They're inherently, they have the same, up, the same um, set of quality characteristics. Um, this is an open, content, contentious area. Another thing which comes up is whether you should use profiles or questionnaires or plan definitions. If you see questionnaires and plan definitions, then you should, or profiles on questionnaires, you should stop and have a good hard think and talk about them on actually on Zulip. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked is what you can and can't say about identifier management policies, identifiers, identification, patient matching. Um, how is that supposed to work? Is it supposed to work? I've seen specifications that assume the patients will magically be matched without making provision for the patients to get matched, for instance. It's not going to actually work in practice uh, outside of a connectathon where you can sort of just verbally say to each other, here's the patient ID that we're going to use. So you should think about those things when you're reviewing an implementation guide. Same with terminology. Um, we still have people bringing forward implementation guides with no terminology at all, or with perfunctory efforts at figuring out terminology. Um, our history is that we didn't invest enough in this, but now we can, and, but it's hard work. And, and it's easy to underestimate the amount of work. So pay attention to terminology. Another thing that often happens is people are really, really keen to simplify the interface. And so they eliminate as much as they can. And the next thing you've got a really fragile interface because it doesn't allow multiple codings as people migrate across code systems so forth. So pay attention to the way terminology is bound because it's easy for that to be either too loose or too tight. And in fact, you can expect a fair bit of pendulum swinging on those things over time. So they are important to review. 
and then have a good hard look at uh, mandatory things. So we talk about resource, meta profile. Um, putting, saying, so a resource can claim in its header, in meta profile, a resource can claim that it conforms to a profile. Claiming it doesn't make it true. You can find out whether it's true using the validator and you can build the validator into your code. Say, I don't care what you claim, I'm gonna check whether it's true and I can find out whether it's true, whether you claim it's true or not and you might claim it to be true and it not be true or you might not claim it but it's true anyway. So for robustness, it's actually better to ignore what the resource claims and, and check it yourself because you can. But of course that can be computationally expensive um, but there's a problem. But Lloyd, since you seem really keen. Uh, the The publication process checks all of the instances against the profiles that they declare. So that shouldn't be something a reviewer needs to manually invoke the validator to do. No, so I was talking more generally. Okay. Yep. But you show everybody how to use the validator, and I'm concerned that everybody's thinking that they're going to have to do that for all of the instances in the IG when we do take care of that part for them. So I was getting to that. We are working to reduce the necessity to put a profile in the resource in the publication process because we believe that you should try and avoid specifying the profile in the resource. So, because putting the profile in the resource makes it fragile. I make a profile and I say, this profile says that you must tell in the resource that you conform to this profile, it's part of conforming to the profile, means that the resource can now only conform to that profile. So you write a US core service that serves up US core resources, and then someone says, hey, we're gonna use that for DaVinci. Oh no, we can't, because it has to put some other profile, and it can't put any other profile in so it's uh, specifying and using meta profile makes very fragile, re unreusable interfaces because the profile claims start being inconsistent with each other. Even though the underlying information content is consistent, the rules about the meta profile tag itself are inconsistent. So we say, try not to use resource.meta.profile. There are valid use cases for doing so around denormalization. Use it when you need to use it, don't use it otherwise, because your capability statement can say, I implement US core, and then everything else should be known, or I implement international patient summary, or I implement um, MHD, <sighs> whatever, and you can say that at the system level, and then you don't need to say it in the resource. And so try not to say it in a resource. And if you see that in the implementation guide, ballot or check that it's, it's actually justified. It's not just there because they hadn't thought through the consequences of it. So challenge that. Same for mandatory extensions, mandatory use of category tags on observations and conditions and documents and so forth. Those things, mandatory, mandatory values of those can turn your, the consequential implementations very fragile because they're not, they don't work well with others. Doesn't mean they're not justified. They just need to be, you need to be careful with that. Particularly if you say, here's a mandatory category binding. I only want one category, my category with my binding doesn't play well with any other kind of category codes and uses. Lloyd, you've got to go burst if you don't speak. The thing to keep in mind there is it's totally legitimate to have a slice that says one of your categories needs to be this one. So you enforce that your category that's going to drive interoperability in your space is present, but you don't want to prohibit other people from declaring other categories or other profiles or other stuff. Right. Huh? 
No, because you want people to be able to create one interface that they spit the same data out to everybody and you consume the pieces of it that you care about. You don't want to force people to write a separate interface just to talk to you. Right. Well, all we're saying is... If all there's a chance that anybody else might need the data, you allow it to be present. All we're saying is mandatory, particularly in those areas, can rapidly turn an uh, interface unreusable. And sometimes that is appropriate and you don't care because it's focused. And other times it turns out it matters. And the community working on the one interface doesn't always realise. So that's why I'm saying review that. Um, you should also pay attention to the extensions. Are the extensions justified? Um, do they have the right context where they're allowed to be used? And in particular, we have a really cool tool around extensions. So let's say I see an uh, implementation guide that puts an extension on a condition resource. I say, gee, that's interesting. Has anybody else done something similar? Here's the condition list of extensions that the implementation guide publisher has seen on condition resource. Um, so you can go look at this and say, here's are all the extensions. This is primarily a tool intended for the committees. As part of the review of their resources, over time they should go and look at this and say, hey, we look at this and see lots and lots of resources, lots and lots of implementation guides using this extension, maybe we should put it in the core. But you can also do this when you're reviewing an implementation guide and say, hey, you put an extension on condition for course and look, there's all these other extensions that do the same thing. You can see that um, certain members of the community are really good at creating their own extensions and not playing well with others, which you can also see from this list. Um, so you can consider looking at this list when you see extensions in implementation guides going, no, we want you to reuse extensions, not make your own up. Of course, you know what authors do, right? They make their own up. <coughs> okay. When it comes to value sets and code systems, um, where we can, we show you the expansion in the guide but the expansion is not actually a reviewable artifact. You can't comment on the expansion and say, we don't think the expansion's right. You can comment on the definition, but the expansion's only for your convenience. So there's three things in particular to check. Check the copyright. Um, we, we have constant problem with stuff creeping in with the wrong copyright or the copyright protects, actually prevents implementers actually implementing the implementation guide, so that needs to be checked. If you see a code system, was this something we should actually have defined or not? Was there somewhere else we could look? Um, you could consider that. And then there's the whole versioning rabbit hole. Um, is this bound to a particular version of a code system? If so, why? If not, why not? I probably would argue generally that it shouldn't be bound to a version, but life is not that simple. So there's no like right answer to that in advance. It depends on the conditions and the context, but when you're reviewing, that would be something to review. Right, and then there's these things. These are the specific things that you should look for in an implementation guide. Does it talk about security? Does it need to? And for each of these things, does it state what its requirements are, either in the IG or somewhere? Does the solution meet what you think the requirements are and are the requirements correct? Does it talk about error handling? Not many of our implementation guides talk about error handling. Bulk data does, but most of them don't. It's left as an exercise for the users to get themselves confused. Um, do they say anything about audit and provenance? And historically, the answer is no, even though they should. We're finally addressing that. Did they say anything about consent and privacy? For instance, uh, let's go back to here. I'll show you an example of something you might want to comment on. 
we were looking at SDC before. Uh, where was SDC? Um, you'll notice here, for the purposes of this implementation guide, must support shall be interpreted as follows. There's no mention of privacy on must support. Should there be? Why would you not mention when you say must support and you mean you must display something or provide something, does that mean that there can be no privacy concerns? Um, I don't think that's what it means. I think we just forgot to consider that in our wording and our writing. Um, so, um, you know, like the International Patient Access says, must support means you will populate this if you have a value and the patient agreed to share it, for instance. Um, you should look at test cases or conformance testing support, whether there are any or whether there might be, or whether there's a reference to a place where you could find some support for that. That would probably be useful. And then there's the safety concerns. Um, for instance, what happens with a patient merge? Um, so I actually asked at Dev Days in June, I had about 400 people in the room, and I asked people how they thought a patient merge should manifest on the API. After a system has merged, merged a patient and you make a request on the no longer valid patient, what should happen? And I gave people three options and asked for a straw vote on the three options and I got 30, 30, 30 on the three options. It was really, really reassuring. <coughs> of course, none of our implementation guides talk about that. We have a project to correct that, so that's something you should be asking. Another thing which is a great source of problems is people provide an API to provide access to the record, so immediately everyone starts making their own clone, synchronized copy of the record. And then they find out that the basic rules of access don't support synchronizing the copy because things you need to know don't, you don't get informed about, so the information starts to rot. Um, if, should the, the, if, if you have an API providing information, it should be specific about this. You can not expect to synchronize, or you can expect to synchronize, and if you can expect to synchronize, does it actually work that way? What are the obligations around that? Um, so should, the instance, if you, serve up by request all the problems on a patient and do you always serve up all the problems or is it assumed that you're only serving up a subset of valid problems? If you're only serving up a subset of valid problems and then you omit something because it's been deleted, then there's no way for the synchronized copy to know that it's been deleted. So the deleted information just hangs around. Not a safe thing to happen. So we've had this problem in production with our implementation guides. Um, so that should be you know, explicitly dealt with. That's what I think. You should review that. And, and then same with the expectations around what search options are available, fixed codes and the intersection between those. We generally argue that it's better if wrong content is wrongly found than if it's wrongly missed out because you can wrongly find it, I didn't want to see that, whereas if you didn't see it, you can't go, oh, that information I didn't see, oh, I did want to see that, but you don't know. So you should think about those things when you're reviewing an implementation guide. I wish I could tell you there was easy answers to those things, because there's, but there's not. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a new trick that you won't have seen before. Um, so, you can run the validator, and instead of saying, so here's an example, you can say, I'm gonna validate all the JSON files in temp, I'm gonna validate this, and this example from the website that we looked at before, I'm gonna do it <coughs> against version four, I'm gonna treat it as a version four resource, I'm gonna scan all of the profiles and all the IGs that I know about, and I'm going to put e output I produce in this directory. So I'll just quickly, I'm not going to run that right now because it's, it's a bit messy for me to run that. But you feel free to actually try running this. It's just that the keys are loading all the IGs of interest. In this case, I'm going to validate this condition and, and an observation. 
against US Corps, against the International Patient Access, which is very, very draft and has no formal standing, and QI Corps, and, and I'll just show you the output. <coughs> but you can do that with the current validator. Oh, clearly this one when I ran this one it was just so so this says just condition example from US core it's valid against the core spec it's valid against US core it's valid against QI core it's valid against all of them I will go and rerun that <clears throat> I'm just going to cheat and rerun it from the my development environment Sorry about this. <clears throat> it's just saved me mucking around with directories while you all waited for me to do that. <clears throat> okay. So now, now you see that these two observations, sorry, two conditions, this observation is the interesting one. This observation is valid against the core. It's not a P, uh, age observation, a BMI observation. It's not a pediatric observation. It is a laboratory observation. It's not, it is a QI core observation, so forth, right? So you can have a set of, the idea is that you have a set of test cases. I got my set of resources and I can throw, you know, ask the validator to validate this across a whole set of profiles and you get a Cartesian join between the, my set of examples and all of the profiles I'm interested in. And so then you can quickly see whether your set of examples are valid against one set of, one implementation guide or not. That makes sense? Okay, so feel free to bang away on that because that's relatively solid. And anybody who wants to take time to make the presentation better or whatever, feel free. Um, it turns out there's quite a lot of information here. Um, but, but the idea is that you're reviewing implementation guides and you have your set of test cases and you can scale that up. Okay, any questions about that? <coughs> okay, all right. <coughs> okay, that brings me to actually comparing IGs, but any questions about reviewing IGs before I get on to that? Yeah, I see. Um, so you, you were saying often the, uh, it depends on the requirements or the requirements dictate what should be there. Um, I do not know if you can expect the requirements to be clearly stated or clearly visible from the, uh, from the implementation guide. So how do we handle that? So I said that they should be visible somewhere. It's probably a good idea for the implementation guide to reference the community collateral that led to the formation of the requirements. But I do think that the requirements should be clearer around some of these things. For instance, security. Does an implementation guide make any arrangements for security? If not, why not? Okay, now a domain-specific implementation guide, it's irrelevant, right? But an implementation guide that describes exchange and it doesn't say anything about security, that's kind of odd. What? What did, what did it have in mind? Um, but so that, I think that requirement should be um, explicit in the implementation guide. On the other hand, um, if we were going to look at some particular element and the fact that the element is must support with a binding of you know, particular 
terminology. I don't expect the requirement for that to be explicit in the implementation guide. It'll be somewhere in the minutes of something somewhere, but it should be findable somehow to someone who wanted to know why did we do that. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be easy to find. They might have to do a bit of work, but they should actually be at least hinted at where they might do that. And we don't have a computable way to do that, right? Sorry? It's on, in the narrative. We don't have a computable way to figure that out. Um, we can. There's, way, there's ways to reference GForge tasks from, from the definitions. That's the nearest we have. <clears throat> Lloyd. Yeah, but we don't really. It's. I'm not not saying we use them. I'm saying we have them. Yeah, we so do. We, ha we have an ability. We have specific places to capture where the requirements came from, where the work group deems it relevant and important to do that. Yeah. So do we have requirements by type of IG? So domain, you should pay particular attention to these. And then where would the new, you mentioned the new mapping IG, how would that factor in? Does it have different? I don't know, we haven't seen one of them yet. I know there's a couple in prep, but I haven't seen them, so. This is, this is work in progress. I'm pretty sure that if, if we went through consistently and reviewed every implementation guide we've ever published against my requirements, all of them would generate hundreds of comments. I'm lifting the bar here, but that's, that's what we're doing. We're lifting the bar, both on the quality of the IGs and the content in them and um, what's coming in the comparison thing that's coming. So, yeah, this is all this work in progress. But I'm encouraging you to start building that expectation and doing a systematic review. <sighs> all right. Okay. Now, comparing IGs. We get this common feedback. Everybody is concerned about the profusion of profiles and implementation guides. Because the basic rule is Anything that anybody else wants is a problem, whereas anything that I want is necessarily important. <laughs> it's very, very hard to get past that. Um, and, and so many people come to me and tell me they're really, really concerned about this at the same time as they tell me they want something. And so the biggest source of this is Wishel's rule. <clears throat> Wes's rule, change the consensus group, change the consensus. And, and it's that that we're pushing back against and saying, well, yeah, but you need to have some consistency. But where does that come from? And, and review is basically where it comes from. Different communities have different but overlapping requirements, and so they have different but overlapping solutions. Different communities have different heritages around architecture, design choices, and cultural balance around the leanness and freedom versus heavily controlled. Different communities have different life cycles and different time frames and different commercial motivations. It, it's a fantasy to think that we can hold these things off. The one that we can target, the spurious contribution potentially to doing things differently, is Wishel's rule and ignorance. Like, for instance, before I showed this, uh, where were we? I think it was this. No. I showed this, the view by resource type, the extensions for a particular element. And I made the comment that people were not comparing that. How many of you know how long we've had this? It's about four months, or five months maybe. So this is new, but, so this, I mean, we're continuing to work because he couldn't find this information before. So we're working on it still but it's getting easier to see what is happening out there because our social network is getting stronger. So, so it's an ongoing process to um, use our social mechanisms to push back against inconsistency. So I want to tell you about the community process very quickly, um, where, where it's a common 
process where communities collaborate together so they tell each other what they're doing, they make sure their extensions and their profiles are registered so they're available to each other. Overlaps and collaborations that result from overlaps are documented in public because we value the fact that we have lots of contributors to community leadership, but that is also a challenge. We don't want to make it go away, we want to collaborate. All the projects in this space have clearly documented transparency and process and license and we act as a community of interest with the goal of minimizing conflict. You'll start hearing more about that um, as we start pushing that to um, increase that. And when you are reviewing implementation guides starting in a few months time, you should be commenting saying, this implementation guide is not part of the fire community process. Why do I have any expectation that it will have any consistency um, interest at all with the rest of the community? Um, <coughs> that applies to HL7 affiliates and to IHE and to any other organization publishing guides and actually to HL7 as well. So I'm working on that. Then there's the accelerator program, which some of you are here because of, which builds on that and commercial agreements around HL7 providing support for doing the things that the community process says needs to be done. And it's effectively standards as a service, but it turns out that that's a kind of hard service to provide, so we're in, still figuring that out. <coughs> so, but the trouble is, any collaboration between sub-communities depends on knowing how implementation guides relate. And, and what people say is, are they consistent? But that has a very flexible meaning. Maybe it means, can I write a single API that meets both the definitions and serves both of them at once? Well, that would be one sense of what consistent meant. Maybe it means that when, I, when the same information surfaces in the API in the document, is the underlying information consistent so that I only have to have one engine down inside that generates content? Or do I have to start writing piles and piles of stacks for different expectations? I hate that. If I get information from different sources, can I do what I need to do in order to manage it, irrespective of how it is that I got it, whether I got it from a US core interface or from an IPS document or from a DaVinci Pass interface, do they use the same codes? There's a whole bunch of things it could mean. Um, are they consistent is a very wide open question. And the same when it comes to profiles, I'm comparing two profiles. There's really mostly no single answer to whether profiles are compatible. There, there can be a single answer to the fact that they're not compatible but not a single answer to the fact that they are. So, so what we're doing, and, I, and I'll show you the tool in a second, instead we generate the intersection and the union of two profiles. So we, we've got a tool that we give it two profiles, and, and then the tool says, okay, I am gonna generate the intersection of the profiles and the union of the profiles. The intersection describes a set of resources that conform to both profiles. So if you're a server serving an API that's subject to two different profiles at the same time, this is the set of resources you can serve up that are valid against both of those. Um, and if that set is empty, then there's nothing you can serve up that's consistent with both of them and they are actually inconsistent. But if that set is not empty, then what is in that set? Is it the set of things you need to do that is in that set? Because if the set of things you need to do is in the set of things that are valid against both profiles, you're fine. But if the set of things you need to do is wider than the set that is valid against both profiles, then you have a problem. And they're not consistent for you. But they might be consistent for someone else. Depends on the intersection of the rules. And then the union is a set of resources that conform to either profile, which would be, if you're a consumer of the information, this is the whole set that you have to deal with, right? So, so you understand the logic of that? Anyone want to ask me more about that? Yeah. Well, so when you're, when you're bring them on server, there's, 
You have the knowledge, there's no knowledge of which profile you're doing it against? So basically, if, if one profile uh, was going to do first name and last name, your profile only wanted last name, you're still going to be able to get the first, first name too just because the other profile said first name and last name? Well, it depends on the profiles. So I could write a profile on patient that says, I only want, just send me the surname, you can't send me the first name, the given names. And then another one writes a profile that says, you must send me a surname and a given name. You can't have a single resource that meets both those profiles because one says no given name and the other says there will be a given name. There must be a given name. You can't be both. So that, that is a set of profiles where the intersection is empty. There's no resources that can satisfy both profiles. But if the one profile says, well, there has to be a surname, a family name, another profile says there has to be a family name and there has to be a given name, the intersection of the profiles is there has to be a given name and a family name, and the union of the profiles is there has to be a family name. That makes sense? So if I'm consuming the information, all I know for both profiles, all I know is that there will be a family name. If I'm serving up information, producing information, I will have to populate the given name and the family name, and I will be valid against both profiles. It, it seems to me that you'd, the, you'd have to, as this, if, otherwise you're going to have proliferation of servers. If, you have, if, if having the requirement that are inconsistent, and then you have multiple profiles hitting the same server, then you're going to end up with, with not satisfying a lot of queries. So that, that's where, well, that's where, say, say you say, let's go with observation as an example. I'm got, I've got one um, profile that says there will be a category and that will be code A or B or C. And then I've got another, another profile that says there will be a category and it will be code B, C or D. And in my database, I have a whole of category A. Now what? But if in my database I don't have any category A, then I'm fine, it doesn't matter. It's just perfectly compatible for me. So, so that's why there's no single answer to whether it's okay, because it depends on what you need to do. So if I'm asked, and, and so if I'm simultaneously claiming to serve both profiles, and one says no A's, and then I get a request, and the request doesn't identify the profile, it might or it might not, and it doesn't identify, then I really don't know what to do in order to be valid. So that's why, that's why we were pushing before that your profile should endeavor, and, and, and it's a newbie move, really. Newbies come and go, well, I'll do this, this, and this, and I'll turn everything else off, right? Because that's what you did with version two. And now you've got incompatible profiles, writing whole server stacks, because someone turned everything off without really thinking about the cost. So our real thrust here is, Profiles should say as little as possible, right? They shouldn't turn stuff off because that's not playing well with others, which turns into writing whole server stacks, which are million dollar efforts. So it's really not a value proposition to turn, to set um, max to zero for stuff you're not interested in. It doesn't play well with others. But if you have to, you have to and you write separate server stacks or, or whatever. Right, so, so it's not like there's a simple answer here. Any, any more questions, comments? Okay. So, the same applies to capability statement. I'm a server, I've got two different capability statements to conform to. Well, it turns out that we can ask the same question. What is the union and what is the intersection of the capability statements? And when I will come back to this, you could do this with the validator. So here's a command with the validator. I want the validator to compare, to compare and put all the output in this directory on the left, my international patient access server and just call it IPA for simplicity and on the right, US core, and just call that US core, 
and, and then load the implementation guides. You guys can run this if you want. You don't need to have any implementation guides loaded locally because it's all using packages to access them. And we're going to compare these two capability statements. Okay, and so you get as output from running that, which I won't run right now, but it, it takes a minute <coughs> in my temporary comp compare, I get a massive number of files, but the interesting things are I get a capability statement. I'll just open them here. <coughs> And nearly there. Okay, all right. So I get two capability statements, the intersection of them, and then the all the way over here. That's really good. I don't know what happened to the other one, and the union of them, but also get quite nicely uh, a nice little web page that compares them. So, so here's two cap two capability statements that say you will serve up allergy intolerance, and it says both of them say you shall serve allergy intolerance. Well, that turns out to be nicely compatible with each other. And this one says you do read and search. This one says you do read and search and you do some other things. So this one here is a subset of this one at this, for this particular set of fields. This one says you support these search parameters. This one does not. So these ones are a clash in that it says you shall do them, and this one does not. So you can, you can write a server that does both of those and be happy because they're consistent with each other, but you have to actually do those. Um, and then we can do the comparison of the profiles. <coughs> the comparison of the profiles compares the two profiles and then the patients that they refer to. If you pay attention, you'll note that I'm redoing all the comparisons all the time and generates a whole bunch of value sets for the min and max because it's value set informed. Okay, so I actually do the diffs on the value sets and that's what you get is the union and the difference with a whole bunch of supporting value sets. <coughs> so the comparison of the allergy intolerances. I have got the image pass wrong, but um, this is the intersection. What is valid against both? And then this is the union, which is a bigger set of stuff. I'm not going to spend time on these, but in this case, they're compatible with each other. Mark. I think this is great. Uh, very, very helpful, and thank you for that. And it just, can you, so any two structure definitions of the same base class? Yeah. So could you do like STU3 um, observation versus R4 observation? Yes, and you, you can nominate either capability statements or structure okay. definitions here, and you nominate the base version which you want to think, think in. But great. the version you nominate doesn't have to match the version of these. So there, what, what's interesting about that version to version is you'll find that there are hard incompatible. Well, you know that. Yeah, I wrote the transforms. I know where they are. <laughs> and it's mainly because of the code system changing, not necessarily um, the value sets. Oh, there's much more than that. Yeah, OK. Well, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the point of the DSP. It's fun. I think you could do that with resources as well. Yeah, that's the point of the, of, that's the, point of, the, trans, of the trial use process is we fix what we got wrong. Okay, so you can do this with any two structure definitions or with any two capability statements. Don't be surprised if it blows up. There's a lot of complexity down inside the value sets and so forth. Um, but if it blows up, don't just go, that Graham, he's an idiot. Go to Julep and say, that Graham, he's an idiot. This doesn't work. Okay? 
Otherwise, it'll just keep not working. But you can do this, so it's pretty magic because you can dance across the versions with this, like Mark said. Um, <clears throat> the output is hard to process because it's not a simple question. The, the answer to this here is that these are not certainly incompatible. You have to go through and compare what's left in the intersection with your requirements. Okay? Now, these particular profiles are both very light profiles that say very little, <coughs> deliberately say very little, so are almost certainly compatible. Um, but there is, I think, one in the set that was not compatible. <coughs> Um, no, not in, yeah, here we go. So the comparison of provenance between the two specs actually generated an error. So, and this is actually a type, this is actually a version change error. So the provenance on behalf of is actually a technical error because the types are incompatible and that's because the committee actually changed the type because we're comparing across types here between R3 and R4. Okay. Are you, uh, I'm not convinced it'll work without trying, but it can make it working. I've got to check whether I actually did all the, value, the versioning stuff. But you would, you would have to load both versions of the IG, and then you would have to, in the command here, you would have to use the version syntax to nominate the two versions. Otherwise, should, if I've remembered to do that bit, it will work, because they're just two different structure definitions. <sighs> OK. All right, so that, that's just the standard validator tool. We'll do that. I encourage you to do that, to check it out. Start with this one and then compare whatever it is that you care about comparing, either structure definitions or capability statements. At the moment, I don't support comparing value sets directly. I could because the logic is down inside the engine, um, but, I, but it, I, that's what I've done so far. Um, if anybody looks at that and says, man, I could do a much better job with a user interface, feel free to wrap a user interface around this, okay? Uh, knock yourself out. <coughs> um, all right, now, I want to show you in the few minutes we have left that I asked... Um, Michele Martini, or we asked, to compare Argonaut with the International Patient Summary. <clears throat> so, so the International Patient Summary has some legs in this Europe where uh, implementers are going to be asked to conform to International Patient Summary. And it specifies a document that is exchanged in the interest of exchanging patient information, whereas Argonaut specifies an API. So there's no like technical overlap between them, only it turns out that really they should basically be compatible because if you're gonna ask for a patient summary and get a set of information, it would really be cool if the set of information you got actually matched what you would get if you asked the Argonaut API. And in fact, if you dumped everything off the Argonaut API and packaged it up into a document, it'd be really cool if that was an IPS document. I mean, that would be really cool, right? Seems like a good idea. That's exactly the kind of consistency that we should strive for. So ONC very kindly funded Michele Martini to actually look at that. Now, this document was not widely distributed, but it was posted to the Argonaut um, Julep track. And I just wanted to show you how he went about it, because it drove my presentation here. He first of all talked about how does it make information available? How I'm orientating on the specification? 
document versus API. Then he talked about their goals and were their goals compatible. And then he talked about how must support works. What's the, what are they trying to achieve? What's the rules around must support? Um, then he compared them in terms of restrictiveness and then we start getting into terminology and content, how content works um, around um, you know, how you say no known, stuff like that, and value sets. And then I just thought I'd... Um, here, here we get to the heart of the why it's a human question. Patient name and identifier optional in IPS required in Argonaut. That's where you get to what's my use cases for whether that's a problem. The medication statement refers to medication as either a reference or a codable concept, but only a reference in IPS. So that's actually a problem, really, more than the other one. Because, you know, something is optional and required in one is something you can work around, but that is much out of the sense. Most things are just a codable concept. Um, identifier is generally prohibited in IPS, but left as optional in Argonaut because we didn't actually have it in Argonaut. Right? We added it after that. And then there's more stuff about extensions and there's some national extensional differences and then a comparison of the resources. Um, and, then, and then this is the rub. This is where it got hard. Right? Document reference. There's the US core document reference profile, whereas IPS uses observation for clinical notes. And so now we're, like you wouldn't pick that up by comparing the profiles, right? That's why the orientation process is critical. Where did information go? Because if one guide says information's over here and another put it over there, the profiles won't tell you that you're in completely different space. And then the same with diagnostic report. IPS uses observation. With children, US school uses diagnostic report. So actually, we went and sat down with this with the IPS team and they said, yeah, okay, we should fix those things. So there's new IPS, I don't know where it is, I forget. It was balloted, does anyone remember? Anyway. Yeah, so they were, the idea was this review, which is exactly the kind of review, but it wasn't powered by the tool I just showed you. But this review, which also came with a Excel document, which did the actual equivalence of the technical comparison that the tool was doing, <clears throat> there really wasn't very much interesting in here. Right? All of the interesting stuff was in the Word document in the orientation. Right? There was some stuff in here, but the really interesting stuff was not in the profiles and the value sets. Okay? So <clears throat> when, when we start going to the community and saying we're looking for people to compare two IGs, we're really saying we want you to compare, do we want you to run through that review process for the two IGs, do the orientation, really understand the structure and flow of them well, and then supported by the tools that I just showed you, compare the two capability statements and compare whatever structure definition should be compared, have some example instances that you scan across the whole IGs. That's the kind of way that you're starting to understand the comparison. Are they consistent, but are they consistent for what? 